Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is John Ertl. I uh, work at a place called Kanazawa University, which is in Japan. Uh, I am not from Japan, um, but I work there. Today I'm going to talk about reconstructions in Japan. Um, these ideas of reconstructions are a lot different than the ones we just saw, um, but they do deal with a lot of these issues of authenticity um, as well. So some of the themes that have already come out come out in this talk. Um, so just a little bit of background. I am a cultural anthropologist. I am not an archaeologist. I've been engaged in a project, a kind of ethnography of archaeology. And so my interest is not per se in what happened in the past, but more along the lines of how do archaeologists help create our ideas about the past? And how do these ideas about the past get enacted into our landscapes? our physical landscapes like this one, our social landscapes, the way we interact, um, as well as our ideological landscapes as well. So these are the kind of issues I'm interested in. Um, so in Japan, there's a lot of buildings like these. These are reconstructed buildings um, that are meant to be um, prehistoric buildings. So anywhere from 10,000 to 1,300 years ago, they represent. But of course, these buildings themselves are only at most 20 years or so old. Um, in general, in Japan, uh, the architecture is based in organic materials. So uh, the excavation of these sites leads to almost no remains. Uh, you get pit house holes and post holes and so forth. If you're lucky, you might get um, burnt carbon remains. And if you're really, really lucky, you might get some waterlogged remains. So the reconstruction of these buildings um, is one based really in conjecture and imagination, not so much in the actual putting back together of materials that were already there. So um, the talk I'm going to give <laughs> today is also embedded in this project that I've been doing, um, doing a database of these reconstructed buildings. Um, the reason why I decided to do this database, this is a nationwide database in Japan, um, is that while there's a lot of information about specific sites and these issues of authenticity and debates about their shape and so forth come up quite a bit, there's no broad surveys to tell us anything about how or where or why they're generally built. So these kind of general statements I couldn't make, so I decided, well, let's just follow where they are. Um, so my database today has found 350 different sites throughout Japan with 900 or so buildings. Um, now, the particular problem I wanted to talk about for this one is the buildings that don't exist anymore. The buildings that were there at some point, but are just not there. And um, in my database, there's 129 that are no longer standing. Now, what's interesting about this, uh, okay, um, I put this together kind of also online. Um, not that I expect anyone to see. This is mostly for me to help um, deal with my data, um, but you can take a look if you have time, um, and you can see kind of how they are all over the place. Um, each sort of individual um, site has some site information, location, um, number of buildings, they're all mapped. You can click and get to another page and look, get more information on each specific building. Um, but one of the things that troubled me as I was putting this together, or as I have been putting this together, is not the buildings themselves trying to get information on them, but this here, which is the remains of a building that at one point was there. And while there's information about the buildings when they're built and so forth, where they go, what happens to them? This is the only picture that exists, exists of, that I could find that of this particular building that no longer exists. Um, in fact, this is a very difficult issue ethnographically as well. Um, I went here and I was asking about the building. Um, I was trying to find out specifically when it was built, when it was destroyed, how it was destroyed, um, and who designed the building. And uh, the man who worked there was very confounded. Um, he said, oh yeah, it burned down about 20 years ago, but didn't know exactly when. Um, and didn't know who built it and who designed it and so forth. And so this information about these buildings is really surprisingly non-existent. Um, so 
Uh, as a little bit more background to these buildings, I want to first talk about how do reconstructed buildings inform our past and our present. And the first kind of thing that's obvious about these buildings or that I, I've learned from putting together this, this database is that reconstructions are really a part of history education in Japan. In terms of their locations, where we find them, they're at historical museums, they're located at archaeological sites, and quite commonly at school grounds. Um, principally, they're managed by uh, boards of education. Um, and as these pictures here show, they're featured in school textbooks. And I think it's pretty interesting how they sit here in school textbooks, um, either as images or as actual reconstructions. But they sit alongside other kinds of materials like flame pots like these and these clay figurines here. And so they sit alongside authentic or original remains and they're placed there as if they are original. Um, and so there's this conflation between what is really an original and what is simply an archeological reconstruction. So there are, in a sense, these are built to convey messages, convey knowledge about prehistoric life ways. Um, in a sense, you know, the building is built there. This is a kind of display inside of one. And there's a long textual explanation about sort of what the life was like and the kinds of things that they um, had and so forth. But there's also a number of meta messages within these buildings. They could also communicate quite a bit uh, a number of ideas or really ideology about the past and present. Um, they're kind of embedded in these narratives about the golden age of the past, ideas of progress, uniqueness, and so forth. Um, this really interesting um, one here has sort of two kids, two parents, and it really kind of conveys this idea of the sort of nuclear family, the post-war ideal family in Japan. And so there's a lot of things that are embedded within these that don't get discussed. And so that's why I think they're kind of interesting. Um, another aspect of this is the life history of these buildings. Um, of course, there's originals and there's reconstructions. And the originals <coughs> go through the sort of life history where there's no settlement there, where the buildings are, are built, they're utilized, perhaps lived in. We're not actually sure if these were actually necessarily lived in. Um, they go through a series of being repaired and rebuilt. They're destroyed, abandoned, and lastly, kind of unearthed as archaeological record. Now, the reconstructions work often at the site where they were unearthed. They first lay down a layer of soil, this idea of vertical displacement, and they often build them right directly above the features that they're meant to represent. Um, however, the utilization is quite different. Um, being repaired and rebuilt is quite different. The idea that they're destroyed and then removed. This aspect is kind of what I'm looking at today. But what's interesting is that up to here, we have actually quite a bit of proper recording. After that, there's almost no records of this, these activities. Um, so site preservation, artifact storage, maps, other materials are very well recorded and preserved in Japan. Um, even post-excavation development activities may be published. This is a particular site that was developed. Um, many, several millions of dollars worth of um, money was invested to create this place. Um, and there's quite detailed information about the two buildings that were there. However, there's no real expectations for any kind of recording after the site development. Um, and so as I was putting together my database, I was quite shocked to see that only one of these buildings is still or currently standing. Um, and the more I looked or I looked around, to see if I could find any information, nothing. Okay. So how do these reconstructed buildings disappear? Well, one of the obvious ways is arson or some sort of intentional burning. Uh, these are often in sort of open park areas. Anyone can come at any time of day and night. Um, one of the sort of sadder examples of this was a homeless man was living in one of these for about five days and accidentally burned himself while in the building. Um, natural disasters like lightning 
um, this one here had become quite run down um, and then it was struck by lightning. This little area over here is where it had existed, but as you see now it's kind of overgrown. Uh, the only remnant of the building itself <coughs> is a picture of it when it was brand new. Um, there's planned burnings where they build them for the sake of burning. This is a kind of ancient period festival where they built the building several months before and had this large festival to burn it down. And there's only really one or two examples of what we could call experimental archaeology, where the building was built specifically to test hypotheses about um, the sort of way that they were built. Um, this one here at Goshino is a very famous example. Built in 1999, they took records of um, heat, humidity, uh, decay, and so forth and burnt it down and have since left it in this condition for the past, um, well, 20 years or so. And uh, the idea is in another 40 years or so, let's go back and excavate and see um, if it is anywhere near what it was when we first excavated. Um, natural disasters like earthquake also happen. Um, this was during the uh, March 11th, 2011 uh, disaster in Japan, uh, the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear um, and today it looks something like this, um, decay, just aging and so forth. This one um, is kind of near where I live and uh, I went to kind of go and take some pictures. This is not my picture. Uh, when I went, these buildings were gone. Um, nearby I asked, well, what happened to them? They said, oh, we had to tear them down last year. Um, they just got too old and they're falling down and they were a risk to kids. So we just took it down. And I asked, are you gonna rebuild it? And they said, no. To rebuild one of these today costs about $200,000 and we just don't have the funds anymore for this. Um, this is another interesting example, site redevelopment. This particular image is again, not mine. One I found through a kind of random Google search and it's the only image of, actually it's one of two images of this building that exists online. And I think it's, um, sort of a sign of the age when it was made, 1988, so kind of pre-internet. Um, the image itself that's up here was 1999, um, but it looks like it was scanned later. And so these kind of periods where um, sort of pre-internet actually make it quite difficult. Today, the site looks like this, um, developed into a mall, housing, and a large lakeside park. Um, site accuracy, um, that this particular site, there actually never were buildings, so they just took it down. And site relocation, where it existed at one place, and they sort of moved it again to another one later. So, why is the decay of re reconstructed buildings not recorded? Well, reconstructed buildings are generally considered as museum displays. So, they're quickly removed or rebuilt um, as they might detract from particular images of the site. Right. But however, for someone like me, they reflect information about the ancient past um, and, and also really the recent past. Um, and I think for, for me, they're really important in that regard. But for the archaeologists who um, are sort of in charge of these, they do not, they're not considered archaeological resources and thus don't have the same kind of protections for them. All right, sort of last example I want to talk about is this idea of missing reconstructions. There's only one previous study um, that did any kind of survey of these buildings in 1979. Um, out of the 150 buildings built before 1980, this was done in 1978, but um, looking at my database, 55 are not there. And for many of these buildings, this publication is the only reference that it was ever there. And I was going to talk about this site as one, um, I'll get a picture here in a moment, a Mimori site in Fukushima Prefecture, which for the longest time I couldn't find any information on. In fact, as I was pre preparing this presentation the past couple of days, well, this was the only image I ever found for the site. Um, this is the kanji at the top for the name of the site. It's in this bright prefecture. I thought, okay, well, this must be it. But this is all I could find. Although, as I was doing some more research, I found this. And I'm like, oh, well, there it is. It's in a completely different location <laughs> from what I originally thought. This was, again, a kind of pre-digital age publication, 1995. Um, highlighting this road that was made and these buildings that were made for the road. Um, looking a little bit more, I found a, a kind of digitization of some sort of 
government publication that has pictures of the building. And I even found um, eventually a kind of blog site that had a kind of detailed announcement about this, this particular reconstructed site. However, that site today looks something like this. Um, the road that was originally built where they found the site, where they decided to reconstruct it as a kind of tourist activity, has since been closed as the development that allowed for this to happen has actually been superseded by new development and a new tunnel that has made access through here a lot easier. So in fact, now this place is completely closed down to the public. Um, so in a sense, by not recording decay, there's a couple things that we miss, a couple things that we lose out on. Um, the first of these are archaeological issues. Um, so, for example, we, we don't learn by not recording this process of decay how long a pit dwelling or any other kind of building can actually stay in a, in a particular site before it needs to be repaired or, or rebuilt or so forth. Um, we don't learn how buildings were destroyed in the past by looking at the ones in the present. Right? Were they intentionally removed? Were they unintentionally destroyed? Um, right? Do the remains of reconstructed build buildings mirror those from the archaeological record? There's also very kinds of social issues. Um, for example, well, what are some of the key issues in maintaining reconstructed buildings? These issues of cost, upkeep, um, and so forth. If the process of decay is not recorded, there's no sharing of this information between the different boards of education that are responsible for these. Right? Why do reconstructions fall out of use? Why not rebuild? And I guess, are there certain types of buildings that are easier to utilize than others is another kind of important question. This is one, this is a 260 square meter um, longhouse that is often used for parties and other kinds of events and is one of the more popular sites in Japan to visit. So the last slide here that I have is that by not recording this process of decay, we're really kind of forgetting both the ancient past and the recent past the recent past as well. The pr preservation of sites, um, to preserve sites in the first place, requires building a sort of presence in social memory. Right? The excavation of a site, they might open it up for public viewing while it's being excavated, but in terms of the sort of preservation, putting sort of new ground on top doesn't allow for, in a sense, a new kind of connection to the site to take place, which is part of the reason why these buildings are very important. Here's an example of them building the building and they're um, using thatch to cover it, which is actually not authentic to the time. But part of the reason why they choose to do this thatch is to teach these school children and so forth about the thatch and they bring in these, these craftsmen and so forth. And that sort of teaching practice is one to learn about the recent past where thatch was used for the roofs, um, as well as learn about the ancient past of that time. Um, so reconstructed buildings also provide reminders of the past um, and as new physical landscapes, they also allow the production of new collective pasts. And the last thing I want to talk about is how the removal of reconstructions not only causes forgetting um, of the site and the recent past, but also prevents new engagements at the place. So I think that's what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you.